commercial dish machines, uh, scale built up in pipes, leaking pipes, aerators and, and faucets uh, that are all blocked. Uh, again, more scale in pipes and then compromised valves. Uh, so the hard water challenges that we all face if we're living in an area where the water hardness is, uh, is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty prevalent would be to reduce ongoing maintenance and work fees, uh, protecting capital equipment from scale buildup, uh, meeting increasing demand for eco-friendly design, the properties, uh, local codes and regulations are always uh, under consideration, uh, maxing uh, maintenance departments' uh, efficiency uh, with their personnel, uh, preventing degeneration of equipment, managing smaller budgets, et cetera. And a lot of these properties have zero tolerance for, uh, for maintenance downtime. Uh, one flow uh, is a, a technology that requires no electricity. Uh, there's no salt, no chemicals, uh, no regeneration. Uh, it's compact. It's an upflow design, and that's important to, uh, uh, to remember. Uh, the water flows through the resin in an upflow fashion, regardless of whether it's a, a tank or a, a cartridge-based unit. Uh, there is no discharge, no wastewater. Uh, so again, no backwashing. Uh, and of course, no control valve. It's environmentally friendly and uh, very easy to install. Um, certainly uh, easy to specify. Uh, we've done a lot with uh, creating specifications um, and making the engineering community uh, easy for them to uh, uh, to uh, specify it. Uh, maintenance free. It is proven scale performance. The technology has been around for uh, for over 20 years. It was developed uh, actually over in Europe, in Germany. And um, one of the things that uh, I think also important is it retains the beneficial minerals in drinking water. Um, it does not remove the calcium and magnesium uh, that traditional technologies do for controlling scale. And as a result, uh, those beneficial minerals are left in the water. Uh, the media is uh, uh, lasts uh, fairly long, uh, two to three years, kind of depending on the applications. Uh, and the flow rates can be anywhere from really a quarter of a gallon a minute. We say a half there, in excess of 900 gallons a minute. And um, so again, reduced efficiency is the uh, is the goal here. Uh, no salt, no chemicals. Uh, very little maintenance other than changing the resin, uh, no backwashing, no downtime, and, and of course, no scale. That's the goal here. Uh, there is a return on investment, uh, so property owners uh, would experience uh, substantially less water uh, going to drain uh, compared to a traditional, let's say, a softening system. Wouldn't have to buy salt, store salt, chemicals, things like that. Um, and of course, uh, it's not electric and prolonging uh, equipment life is very important. Uh, we like to say it's a green solution because of the same reason. No salt, no chemicals, no energy usage, a reduced footprint. Uh, I'll show you uh, what we mean by that. Uh, it could help also earn lead credits um, if uh, it's chosen over a water software. This is a, a slide that, that shows you uh, really kind of a, a bird's eye view uh, the predominant uh, thing that we're looking for would be three 36-inch diameter tanks. Uh, those would be a triplex uh, water softener system with a big brine tank, that 40-inch, 40 48-inch diameter tank. You can see the space that that traditional softener would take up for a 300-gallon-a-minute design. Uh, the, the couple of pallets of salt you see there as well. So that whole space compared to the four tanks on the left-hand side of the screen, um, 16-inch diameter tanks, uh, they're plumbed in parallel, and the reduced footprint is uh, quite significant. Um, this is how the one flow works, kind of the science of it. Um, what we do is we actually have a resin uh, in the tanks. Uh, we call it a resin or, or one flow bees, as they're sometimes referred to. Uh, and it, uh, it has an attractive uh, surface. Uh, there's an attractive nature to it, and as water flows through it, water that contains calcium and, and bicarbonate, um, the calcium is uh, represented by the, uh, the more magenta color or the kind of the reddish colored uh, things on the left-hand slide, and, uh, and the purple, uh, the HCO, would be the bicarbonate. 
uh, on the surface of the resin are what we call nucleation sites. These are preferred areas where scale uh, is attracted to. And as a result of water flowing through the, the resin, uh, the calcium and bicarbonate join and creating a, what's called a, uh, a crystal, a microcrystal of scale. We're actually making uh, 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 calcium uh, carbonate, uh, which is scale, and the slide under, or I should say, the, the picture on the right-hand side of that screen um, is a sea crystal being released from the surface of the resin. So uh, we like to say that the, uh, uh, the technology catches or, or creates uh, calcium carbonate, these microcrystals of, of, of scale, and releases them. The downstream plumbing gets littered with calcium carbonate crystals. These crystals are not in the visible spectrum. So we're not talking about uh, drawing a glass of water that's been treated with one flow and seeing floating calcium carbonate crystals. They are not in the visible spectrum, but they are very important to the plumbing system in protecting it downstream. The other thing that the uh, one flow resin does when it releases that, that, that crystal from its surface, that surface area is now free to create more microcrystals. And that's why the resin lasts as long as it does without being regenerated. It's constantly catching and releasing microcrystals of scale downstream and does that over and over and over again uh, during the course uh, of its life. Uh, back to the uh, one flow versus a conventional softener comparison. Uh, the total area that we showed uh, in that previous uh, was uh, described as roughly about 88 square feet of space for the softener versus uh, close to 14 square feet for the one flow system. That's, that's an enormous space savings in that. The salt usage is, is pretty dramatic too when looked at uh, over the course of a year. Uh, that system uh, based on 15 grains of water uh, and the amount of, of gallons that that property was using was using 64,000 pounds of salt a year at a cost of just under $8,000 for the salt, um, of course, zero cost for the one flow. The wastewater volume is significant as well when you consider the cost of water, uh, both coming in as well as discharge. And then the labor on a softener, you've got to add salt to the brine tank uh, for a total savings, a uh, yearly savings of in excess of $16,000 for that one property. So pretty significant uh, savings that the uh, one flow could offer. The uh, applications that we have for one flow, uh, of course, would be point of use and point of entry, uh, treating all the water in a, in a property, uh, tankless or standard water heaters, boilers, steam generators, uh, convection steamers. We get involved in food service as well, uh, proofer ovens, as well as coffee machines and, and uh, espresso machines, dishwashers, piping systems, steam generators, misting systems, et cetera, and, of course, mixing valves. So uh, the, the applications are, are, are very, uh, very wide, and um, as a result, one, one flow uh, has been used in, in, in many applications successfully. Again, back to uh, the flow rates, uh, the, the small cartridge that you see in that slide uh, would do, let's say, a half a gallon a minute, whereas if I put several tanks in, uh, in parallel and install them, uh, we could do in excess of 900 gallons a minute. Uh, this uh, gives a little bit more of a, uh, a look at uh, both the cartridge systems, uh, both by themselves, which would be scale control only. And I mentioned earlier how one flow is complemented by other technologies. So in this particular case, in a two cartridge system, as we show in the lower part of that of the screen, um, we're using carbon, a carbon block. Uh, so we have sediment reduction in carbon uh, for chlorine removal followed by the one flow technology. So now we're getting the benefit of really, excuse me, three different things going on there. We've got sediment reduction, we've got chlorine, uh, and taste and, over, taste, taste and odor improvement, uh, as well as scale control. So again, combination technologies here, complementing one another. Uh, for tank type systems, this is where we're talking about higher flow rates, uh, more in a point of entry applications uh, we can do 10 gallons a minute, 12, 16, all the way up to 75 gallons a minute, single tank. Uh, and if your need is in greater than that, let's say in a larger commercial building, uh, we, we put the tanks together, uh, as you can see in, in this slide, 
and we plumb them again in parallel. Uh, the header at the bottom there is actually the inlet side of those tanks, and the uh, the outlet uh, that you see there is where the water would exit and, and go back into the plumbing system. So again, if we put uh, six of the 75 gallon a minute tanks together, we'd have a 450 gallon a minute design. Um, just a quick, uh, you know, understanding one flow, uh, it's generically referred to as template assisted crystallization or, or TAC uh, for short. Uh, it's, it's best to find that resin, those resin beads uh, as a copolymer uh, with a special coating uh, that helps to precipitate or form uh, scale. We purposely <laughs> are trying to make these microcrystals. That's part of uh, the technology and how it works. Um, so these helpful microcrystals go downstream and they result in no scale formation uh, to heat transfer surfaces in areas where scale commonly forms. Uh, this system cutaway uh, would give you a, a good idea of what a system looks like both when it's idle as well as when it's in service. So in the first um, tank on the left, uh, you see the inlet to that is at the, at the bottom. Uh, the water comes in, it gets, uh, uh, it goes through a little diffuser there uh, where the water ends up getting pushed down. Uh, the idle tank would be, that would be an example, let's say, of a, of a tank in a hotel at 3 o'clock in the morning. There's no water going through it. Uh, the, the media is just resting uh, at the bottom of the tank. Uh, now at 7, 8 in the morning, we now have a fluidized bed of media uh, as the water flow uh, has picked up, and that resin that was sitting at the bottom of that tank is now throughout the tank and uh, being helpful in making those microcrystals of scale. Uh, the water that exits at the top of the tank uh, to the service line uh, is now uh, have the, uh, the beneficial microcrystals in it, and that's helpful for, uh, again, surfaces downstream. Up close on the surface of the resin, you might see something like this, where the, the, the scale formation is on that surface, uh, and uh, that's what the, the TAC, the templates on that resin surface assist in crystallization of calcium carbonate, again, TAC. So when we make the case for one flow, in, in particularly in commercial applications, uh, we look at uh, third-party verification. Uh, the ASU study uh, we, we pointed to, this was done uh, independently uh, by the Arizona State University. Uh, it was done in cooperation with uh, the engineering consulting firm called HDR. So there were some doctors uh, and engineers involved uh, in this. And the whole idea here um, was they were evaluating alternatives to domestic or ion exchange uh, softeners. Uh, ion exchange is the technology that water softeners use. And, um, and the premise here, uh, folks, is that water softening is not a sustainable technology for the next 50 to 100 years in areas where water reuse is important. I mean, water reuse is important everywhere, but in particular, areas in like Southern California, Phoenix, Las Vegas, where you have large populations, and the wastewater uh, that goes to the waste treatment plant, they actually bring it to a point where they put it back into the Earth's surface and blend it either with river water for reuse. So the problem with water softening is you're adding chloride, you're adding sodium to that water. And uh, it's difficult to remove. So when, you, when that water comes back, the chloride level is higher, the sodium level is higher. And when you do this for 60, 70, 80, 100 years at a time, uh, that's going to create a situation where agriculture uh, will not be uh, very happy with the, uh, the increased sodium level uh, that we're using. And uh, so that's creating a problem. So the idea here was to test technologies uh, you know, a, a traditional softener, and and verify that these technologies, these, these technologies that did not use salt, were not salt-based systems, would actually work. That they work, and the, so this uh, technology again, uh, the percent of scale reduction efficiency in untreated water when they brought the water to 80 degrees C uh, is 99 percent scale reduction efficiency when they brought it to 60 degrees C. Uh, is about 97% scale reduction efficient, uh, very high. And uh, 
Uh, the technology, the uh, presentation or the testing uh, involved four different technologies. Uh, one was magnets or electromagnets. One, one was electrically induced precipitation, uh, which can be described kind of as a wraparound device. Uh, and then another technology was capacitive deionization. And then, of course, the TAC that, uh, that we're uh, proudly uh, uh, presenting right now. Uh, there are also regulatory pressures that are uh, that we're seeing uh, nationally. Uh, in California, it started where a lot of things do start. A California legislation a few years ago banned uh, softeners, uh, discharge softeners, uh, in areas where uh, it was causing uh, problems with the wastewater treatment. So uh, again, regulatory pressures will continue to come this way, uh, and, and again, with water reuse where it's so important. Uh, we will also, I will say, uh, over the next 20 to 30 years, be looking at uh, restrictions in areas where you never thought that softeners would be uh, considered to be banned. Uh, the World Health Organization has indicated that uh, uh, hard water is actually good, uh, beneficial. The beneficial nutrients are good rather than removing those. So uh, hard water is uh, considered to be uh, uh, more appropriate for consumption than it would be for softened water or low mineral water. Uh, the next uh, few slides, we're going to look at some installations here so you can get a, a, an idea of what the uh, one flow uh, systems would look like. Uh, on the left here, we're looking at uh, uh, the properties, actually, Marriott property in Marriott, I'm sorry, Manhattan Beach, uh, California. Um, 385 room property uh, now being protected by four one-flow tanks. Those are 75 GPM tanks plumbed in parallel. And uh, so, uh, again, very happy that they got off the softener out there and they put the one-flow tanks in, and uh, very happy with that. There's a, uh, a Frito-Lay processing plant in Beloit, Wisconsin, that originally put in three of the one-flow tanks. You'll see that in the photo on the right. They added a fourth, and that's that one tank on the left. Uh, so they now have a 300-gallon-a-minute design, and um, enjoying the, uh, uh, you know, the, the beneficial uh, results of the scale control that the one flow is providing for that treatment plant, processing plant for uh, free to lace chips. Uh, there's a, a property in, in Windsor, Ontario. Windsor, Ontario. Uh, it's a Caesars property. Uh, before putting in one flow, they had all kinds of scale and. Uh, the humidification system, and after putting in one flow, uh, uh, everything kind of cleaned up, and they were very delighted with uh, with that. Uh, Embassy Suites Hotel in uh, in New Jersey uh, put in a four tank system, and uh, again uh, took out a softener, put this in. We're very delighted. Uh, the high school, uh, this is a large high school in, uh, in in Texas, put a 225 gallon a minute system in. And um, that aerial photograph you see there is a combination of both a high school and middle school that are having the benefits of that one flow. Uh, another school in Texas um, seeing uh, you know, the benefits of the one flow technology, again, used as an alternative to uh, traditional water softness. Uh, in the resort uh, community, we've got several of these installations. This one happens to be at the Atlantic Beach uh, property. Uh, in Florida, uh, called uh, One Ocean, uh, fairly high-end uh, area, kind of a resort area uh, in the Jacksonville area of Florida, uh, put in uh, four of the one flow tanks and are enjoying uh, scale control, scale production throughout their plumbing system. Uh, this is one of the largest installations we've done to date. It was a 900 gallon a minute uh, design. You can see that the tanks on the right hand, the right hand picture. Uh, those were uh, 12 75 gallon a minute tanks that were uh, installed in parallel to provide 900 gallon a minute to a uh, combination uh, Marriott property and Ritz Carlton. So, very large, one of our largest properties uh, that we've been involved with for one flow. Uh, some of the case studies that we've got um, one is uh, Crown Plaza. Uh, this is down in Key West. And um, this it, yeah. protected the uh, the hotel called La Cancha, and it's it's a uh, it's been a property that's been around for 
for many years. Uh, this installation actually started back in 2007. And um, so that was 160 uh, rooms, uh, pool, laundry, et cetera, and uh, they're delighted with the scale control that they've had down there for. It's uh, going on eight years then. Uh, Embassy Suites in, in Tempe, Arizona, also they had 12 grains of hardness. Uh, they put this just on the hot water side. Uh, domestic hot water, and uh, it's been uh, it's a little bit dated, that slide there. This has been uh, in since 2008, so this, too, is up to seven years now, performance. Uh, this is a boiler inspection report that we've gotten from the embassy suites back then, and they were uh, delighted. Uh, I, unfortunately, kind of ironically, the, the inspector thought it was a softener and put that it would not be possible for the tubes to be this clean if not for the softener but he was actually looking, uh, mistakenly, he was looking at a one-flow system. Um, apartment complex up in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, dealing with 30 grains of hardness, and uh, it's a 60-unit apartment residence. Uh, they didn't have space for a traditional softener. They put the one-flow system in, a uh, two-tank system, and were able to uh, provide uh, uh, immediate uh, uh, protection to the water heaters that were constantly failing, uh, as well as fixtures. Um, sheriff's office, we get involved in correctional facilities. This is actually a big application for one flow, uh, particularly in, in correctional facilities where uh, they don't like the intrusion of salt delivery. Uh, the softeners obviously need salt, and a lot of correctional facilities there, uh, they don't like the, uh, the fact that uh, outside companies need to bring salt in. So as a result, they try to get away from uh, the salt-based systems, and uh, it helped out there. We've had a lot of success as well in uh, and right now in both in Indiana as well as Ohio in the uh, correctional uh, market. Uh, Capitol Reef uh, Field Station in Utah was a was kind of a big uh, installation for us. This is a place that's very difficult to get to. Uh, as a result, it was difficult if they put a softener in to get a truck there to deliver the salt. As a result, uh, they decided to put the one flow system in, and uh, it was 86 grains of hardness. A very extremely hard, way off the charts hardness, and the one flow has been uh, uh, doing a great job. Um, Han Winery, so we're also involved in, in, uh, in some wineries out in California. This is in Monterey, and the one flow systems that you see to the right there are actually this is an exterior installation. Uh, I wouldn't ex I wouldn't recommend that in Kentucky, Ohio, or Indiana. Uh, not with the weather we we get here. Uh, but in regions where uh, it does not freeze, uh, these systems can be can be put outdoors. And um, so, uh, again, this was used for protecting the boiler. As a result, of Han Winery very uh, very happy that they, uh, they do not have a, a, dis a salt discharge system in that area. Napa, also Napa, California, uh, they have the sea suites, and you'll see those tanks. They have uh, the special strutting around them. That's that's uh, the seismic requirements for installations out in California. Again, another boiler inspection certificate. Uh, the uh, chief engineer was very happy that the boilers were keeping the uh, keep the one flow system were keeping the uh, boilers free of scale. Uh, Double tree property out in Southern California, 41 grains of hardness, uh, way off the charts again. Uh, one flow. Uh, Went in there, the boilers were being serviced every 10 to 14 days, uh, and now they do very little uh, servicing other than changing the resin of the medium. And um, another installation here, this would be uh, an area already in La Quinta, California, uh, near Palm Springs, where uh, softeners were already uh, not allowed. They didn't allow softeners. So the, the cream colored tanks you see there are actually softening the water, but they are uh, portable exchange tanks. So those tanks have to be changed out every 10 to 14 days. Uh, as a result, it's, it's very expensive. So uh, we'll go back to that. Uh, the, we, they put the one flow system in there and they save themselves a bunch of money every month, as well as the hassle of swapping out those tanks. Uh, the, the rest of the presentation is gonna be devoted to a little bit kind of the core technologies. Um, that are specified by engineers and certified plumbing designers. Um, commercial backwashing filters uh, for sediment reduction. Uh, commercial carbon systems for chlorine reduction and 
improving taste and odor, um, commercial and industrial water softening systems, and then commercial RO systems. So first with um, commercial backwashing filters, uh, the technology that we use is called MicroZ. Uh, and um, this is a mined material. Uh, it's got tremendous surface area on it, and it does uh, a lot better in sediment reduction than typical sand filters would do. Uh, this, uh, this next slide shows the magnification of one of those, uh, uh, one of the, the media that makes up that micro-Z. You can see there's jagged edges, and that's very helpful in, in reducing sediment as water flows through that resin. Let me go back to the tanks here. Uh, you can see uh, the, the tank on the very left-hand side would be a, a ta tank for, uh, let's say, a one-and-a-half-inch uh, uh, control valve, uh, maybe upwards of 40 gallons a minute. Uh, the tank in the middle, uh, two-inch control valve, could do maybe uh, uh, in excess of uh, uh, 80 gallons a minute. And, the, and then the tank on the right, uh, three-inch control valve, maybe for something around 120, 130 gallons a minute. So again, depending on the size uh, of the application, uh, we would uh, appropriately size that. And of course, you can add tanks with that if you need uh, additional flow rates. Uh, carbon systems are very similar to the micro Z in that the resin is, is or the, in this case, the carbon is loaded in the tank. Uh, water comes in and then passes through uh, the carbon, uh, and uh, chlorine and off taste and odors are removed as a result of coming in contact with that carbon media. Uh, we put down there GAC. GAC is just an acronym for granular activated carbon. That's what the uh, GAC, and you can see that it's a black colored media. Our uh, water softening systems, um, primarily what you're looking at are three different types there. The, the system on the left would be a simplex. A simplex system uh, includes a, a single control valve, a single mineral tank, which is just underneath it, of course, the, the softener resins inside of that. And the black thing uh, just behind it is the brine tank. So that's a simplex softener. Uh, the tank in the middle is a twin alternating. And that would be in applications where you did not want to have uh, the potential downtime of a tank that was regenerating. And uh, as a result, you could be getting hard, hard water bypass. So the idea with the twin, salt, twin uh, alternating is that one tank is in service while the other is in standby. And when one tank reaches its capacity, uh, the valve automatically switches to the other tank that's in standby, and you have uninterrupted soft water uh, in that particular application. They share the brine tank. They also share a common uh, control valve that switches back and forth. Uh, in a duplex alternating or triplex, et cetera, uh, you could even do a quad. Uh, you, the, the tanks would work. Uh, they can work both in alternating. They can also work uh, in what's called a progressive design. In a progressive design, one tank is primary, it's in service, and a second or third tank would would come into service based on flow rate. So that's another uh, option that you have uh, when you are uh, uh, specifying uh, a water software. Uh, in commercial reverse osmosis systems, an RO, uh, RO is actually a relatively new technology to water treatment, even though it's been around for 60 years. Um, reverse osmosis is a semi-permeable membrane that purifies uh, water, uh, removing the minerals, um, and it's used, uh, you know, very often in high purity applications. Uh, but it's actually even used in, in many uh, water bottling plants. Uh, both Coca-Cola and Pepsi employ reverse osmosis to make their two uh, water brands. One, uh, Pepsi, uh, Pepsi's is called Aquafina. You probably all had it. That's straight reverse osmosis water. And uh, Coca-Cola has a product called Dasani. And um, that also is reverse osmosis purified, uh, but then they add a little bit of minerals to give it a little bit of character or taste. So if you've ever had Dasani or Aquafina, you've drank in uh, reverse osmosis treated water. Our, all of our engineered products uh, have uh, engineering specification sheets. They include a lot of information that specifiers and engineers would require, uh, including the specification itself. If you're looking to for a written specification, uh, that can be found um, on the website. 
In addition, we have CAD drawings uh, in both 2D, 3D, and Revit uh, that can be taken from the website and used in your design. Uh, we also uh, have a, uh, a, a service called Applied uh, Technical Services, um, and they actually, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a design service specifically for engineers. And um, as one of the sponsors of their service, uh, the Watts products, including backflows and PRVs and so forth, are all featured on that uh, ATS site. So if you have not used that, uh, you could Google ATS and uh, and check that out. But it does have design and support services on that. Uh, for participating uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, we certainly want to thank you. But as Jim alluded to in the beginning, you'll also be provided a, uh, a CEU uh, certificate of your kind of completion of this course and, and putting up with me for the last uh, well, I guess it's 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes. And um, But uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, open up. Uh, or Jim will probably read a couple of uh, questions that if you've ever, if you text him during the presentation, yeah. he'll read those. And then we'll open this up, uh, unmute, and uh, people can uh, you know, ask any question if uh, some of the information presented was, was not clear. Uh, I wanted to get through this uh, uh, because... Uh, save a little bit of time at the end for, for questions. Um, the other thing uh, I'm going to leave with this right here would be the, uh, the online uh, information. If uh, some of the information on the OneFlow technology uh, was not clear, if you've got, you can certainly go on to the scale solution or choose OneFlow.com. In addition to that, uh, with working with McGraw-Hill and Dodge, we uh, created a course uh, on, the, on their continuing education site uh, and uh, if you log on to that, uh, you'll also be able to get uh, a CEU credits uh, from taking that course. By having this precursor, I'm sure you'll ace that course. So anyway, let's open it up to, uh, to questions. And uh, thanks for, uh, again, enduring the last 35 or 40 minutes while I was at this airport and putting it up with uh, some of the, uh, the background noise. Yeah, thanks again, Steve, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we have had a, a couple questions come in via the chat feature of the program. Uh, first question is, uh, how often should the OneFlow media be replaced? Yeah, I mean, we, we said um, in the uh, instruction manuals, uh, the straight answer, of course, is, is three years. Uh, there are some applications where it may have to be a little bit more than that, uh, and some applications where um, you encounter really some ornery water or perhaps sediment reduction was not employed uh, when it should have been, uh, you could uh, exhibit or, or experience a little bit of uh, early life on the, on the, on the media. But uh, by and large, we recommend three years replacement. Uh, and um, so that's, that is what is recommended based on uh, a lot of the historical data that we have. Uh, you should feel uh, very safe uh, recommending that and, and doing so proactively. Um, another question, Steve. Uh, what is the purpose of a brine tank uh, with the water softeners? What does the brine tank do, I guess? Yeah, the, the, the brine tank is in, in, a, in the water softening process, uh, which is also referred to as ion exchange. Um, the brine tank is actually storing salt. So it could be, you know, it could be rock salt, but it, typically you want to put in, uh, you know, pellets of salt there. And uh, the salt then gets mixed with, with water, uh, which is added from the control valve. And when water and, and salt are together, uh, it creates a, a brine solution, a salty solution. That salty solution is used to regenerate the water softener resin. Uh, because, uh, again, we call a softener an ion exchange system. With ion exchange, we're removing calcium and magnesium that's in the water and replacing it the exchange ion is actually sodium. So the sodium chloride, which is created by that brine solution, is used to regenerate the resin and prolong the life of the, uh, of the water softener. Okay. Uh, let's see, one more question so far. Uh, can one flow be used in a closed loop system? No, it's, it's, it's not recommended in a closed loop system. Um, one of the important things, and I 
I met, probably didn't stress this enough was that those microcrystals of calcium carbonate that are that are created on the surface of the resin, they must at some point go to drain. So uh, whether it's you know through a faucet opening up, uh, a toilet flushing, uh, a shower uh, going to drain, etc., uh, that water eventually needs to go to drain that contains those crystals. In a closed loop system where one flow is uh, maybe a part of a, uh, a makeup stream, uh, there's not a discharge. Uh, so uh, the microcrystals, their purpose is going to be compromised. Uh, now, there are, could be some applications in a closed loop where monitoring of a, of a, of a system, let's say a boiler, uh, would be followed by a discharge, a blowdown. And in some of those applications, we could consider one flow, uh, but I'd like to do so knowing completely uh, what the application is, uh, what the end goal is, and so. Uh, but, but again, the, the the common answer is no, not in a closed loop system, uh, not certainly not without a blowdown. Okay, a uh, couple more questions, Steve. Okay, does it still have the same benefits as softened water in terms of less soap for laundry purposes? Which is big in the in a hospitality application, right? Yeah, that's 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 a good, really good question, uh, and and thanks for that. No, I I could not uh, equivocally say that one flow will give you the benefits of of less having to use less soap for lathering, or, or less detergent, let's say, in a uh, uh, a dish machine or even a, uh, a a machine where you're washing clothes, and that's one of the benefits of a softener. Um, now, I will say this, though. You will use less soap with one flow than you will with untreated water. And the reason for that is the uh, soap gets interfered with. They're called interference ions. And, uh, and a softener, of course, with no calcium and magnesium, uh, those interference ions are removed, and that's why you get better lathering. Uh, with one flow, we're actually tying up a lot of those interference ions with those microcrystals. So you do get some benefit uh, of, of reduction in soap, uh, but not to the degree of a softener. So if the end result or the end goal is for reduced soap, uh, then, uh, then I would not uh, necessarily recommend a one flow uh, in that particular application. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, what startup procedures are recommended? I have heard that copper piping requires biofilm development prior to using one flow. Is that true? Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, yes, that's, that, that is a correct statement there. The one flow resin um, is very susceptible or can be susceptible to, um, to copper fouling. Okay, and copper fouling typically occurs in the, in the, you know, the startup of a, of a brand new plumbing system where copper is used on the feet side. So if you've got fresh copper and you put that system, that one flow system into service and that, and that, uh, that co those copper pipe, pipes have not been properly either oxidized or passivated through a couple of weeks of, of use, that fresh copper that's, that's rinsing inside there will deposit itself on the surface of the resin. So what we do in those applications where you have Again, copper, fresh copper on the feed side. We, we recommend putting the tank into bypass, of the, again, the one-flow tanks or tanks into bypass. Allow the copper to passivate. And through normal usage over the course of a, a month or so, that copper level will, will flush through. And as a result, you can safely put the one-flow tanks or cartridges into, into service um, after that copper has oxidized, passivated, uh, pickled, whatever you want to do to describe what's taking place. Uh, but again, uh, the fresh copper uh, will be susceptible to one flow. The one flow will suck it up, uh, and uh, it will it could compromise the surface of the of the media. So again, a very very good question there. Now, if the uh, engineer or uh, plumbing designer uh, has specified a non-copper uh, on the inlet side. And it could be CPVC, uh, stainless steel. Uh, that same precaution does not need to take place. So again, it's just when we're looking at fresh copper on the inlet side, and we need that passivation time. 
Okay. Good question. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, when would you recommend using just a one flow in lieu of a softener? At what point would you recommend using both? In Dayton, gotcha. there are some areas with 30 grains of hardness. Would you want a yep. softener yep. to soften the water and one flow to prevent the scale line buildup? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me let me uh, let me address that. Um, in in the majority of scale control uh, applications where the ultimate goal for the, the engineer or the certified designer is to, provi is to provide equipment life, you know, trouble-free uh, uh, service of the plumbing system, including water heaters and things like that, is that I would almost always recommend one flow if the goal was, again, reduce footprint, uh, didn't want to be involved with uh, salt going to brine tanks uh, and, things, and things like that. Um, if there was another goal, You're right, if, yeah. for example, uh, the closed loop boiler required softened water, you can actually soften after one flow. So you can have one flow system in on all of the water in that on a property. And if you've got a, a closed loop boiler uh, that requires makeup uh, and that water needs to be zero grains of hardness, then you could soften after one flow. But you wouldn't you wouldn't use one flow after a softener. Because again, once the calcium and magnesium has been removed, um, there's uh, the one flow cannot provide any benefits. But you can, on point of use applications, uh, another example would could be with a um, a, a dish machine. Uh, you could soften after one flow on a big property, and you had a specific application where a dish machine, where you were uh, water, where you were um, uh, softening uh, specifically for a dish machine that had uh, Oh, maybe uh, wine glasses, and you wanted the wine glasses to come out with a beautiful spot-free rinse. So you could argue that put a, a water softer, a point-of-view softer uh, in that application after one flow. So that's where the, the technologies can complement one another. Okay, thanks, Steve. Looks like we got uh, one more sure. question. Uh, uh -huh. What is the major advantage of one flow over a product like Fluid Dynamics? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not um, completely uh, up to speed on the technology that Fluid Dynamics is using. Uh, is it is it resin based? I, I think maybe if we unmute the lines here, the person that asked that maybe could share. If it is a resin based technology, uh, it could be similar to OneFlow. There are other manufacturers of resin based technologies. Um, I would I would say that uh, not knowing it's, it's difficult to comment comment, uh, but there is a, another technology that is not nearly as robust as the TAC technology, uh, meaning it, it cannot meet uh, 75 grains of hardness. Uh, it does not have the life uh, and uh, and call it the, uh, uh, the the scale removal efficiency uh, that the OneFlow has. So it's kind of a uh, uh, call it a, uh, a poor facsimile, uh, and uh, the technology just doesn't meet the, uh, uh, that that the uh, the TAC or one flow has achieved in uh, independent testing. Yeah. Okay. But if you want, yeah, let's uh, let maybe unmute the phones and see if uh, the person that, uh, can uh, elaborate a little bit on. On the technology like he, that makes them. He chatted again here. He said uh, fluid dynamics is a saltless softener that uses an alloy in the line, or, or really a descaler. Um, yeah. 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 One you, of the things I one of I would say and again, and not knowing the company that one of the pet peeves that people who have been in the water industry have forever, and, and and people like me that have sold softeners forever, is that when you use the term saltless softener. It really is a misnomer, and and it's almost used to. I would say it's used more to confuse, because there's really no such thing as saltless softening. If you're removing, um, if you're softening, you have to use an ion exchange. You have to take out the calcium and magnesium. So if you're using a technology that's literally um, through a titration test, uh, creating that water or that water to be uh, soft. That, that resin needs to be regenerated. So you have to use either salt or a salt substitute, which could be a magnesium uh, chloride. Uh, but 
saying it's a saltless softener, it's really it's it's a poor use of uh, terminology, um, and it's again I would say it's more of a marketing term um, than it is a uh, a real an industry uh, at least the, those in the water quality industry uh, would not use that, uh, that that term there. So I would beware of companies that promote the, themselves as saltless softener because it's it's really just about impossible. <laughs> To, okay. To stop something without regenerating that resin, you know, without regenerating that medium. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, thanks again for your time, Steve, and the excellent presentation. And uh, thank you again to everyone who attended this first Dizzy McLean University class. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask after the presentation, feel free to give us a call. Uh, we're more than help, happy to help you out, and uh, maybe even an outside salesman can come visit you and give you a demonstration. Um, also, some of the attendees, I didn't really sign in, um, so let me share my email address. If you want, send me an email with your contact information that you did attend this class, and uh, I will send out ASPE CEU certificates to those who did attend. Uh, so again, thank you, everybody, and be sure to join us next time. Uh, our next class is May 5th, covering thermostatic mixing valves. Uh, Hope you all have a good day and stay safe on the slippery roads out there. And and, and thanks, and Jim. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, having me do this, and hopefully the uh, the attendees, the attendees, the call-ins that uh, got a lot of uh, benefit from it. Thanks. I think so. Thank you, Steve. Okay.